I'm Nikki Lowe and welcome to the Wisdom for Working Mums podcast show where I share insights and interviews that support women to combine their family, work and life in a more successful and sustainable way. In today's episode we're talking about perfectionism. If you ever feel like your high standards leave you feeling stressed or that your ambition causes you to beat yourself up for not being good enough or achieving enough, or if you struggle to relax and switch off, you might suffer with perfectionism. It's actually a common trait in ambitious and achievement-orientated women, and it can leave us holding ourselves to impossibly high standards. And whilst we may have been led to believe that perfectionism is an honourable quality, many of us know from personal experience that it can suck the joy out of life and leave us feeling exhausted. Unfortunately, it can actually get in the way of us succeeding and it can negatively impact our relationships, our work and even our health. And today's guest, Michaela Thomas, is an expert on perfectionism and she's here to help us if we suffer from it. Michaela is a senior clinical psychologist and a cognitive behavioural therapy psychotherapist and she has a huge amount of experience in supporting people, particularly working mums with perfectionism. And I'm delighted that she's going to share her wisdom with us today on this episode. And in this episode, Michaela shares some really important distinctions around perfectionism and some really useful insights into what to do if we find ourselves experiencing the unhelpful side of perfectionism. And the truth is, is if we're going to thrive as working mums, we have to keep a check on our perfectionist tendencies. So if you'd like to learn more from this episode, do head over to the worksheet that we've got that accompanies it. And you can find that at wisdomforworkingmums.co.uk forward slash 23. I hope you enjoy this episode and I'd love to hear your feedback as always. It's great to hear from you. So head over to social media and share with me any thoughts, comments, insights you have from listening. Thanks and enjoy. So welcome to the show, Michaela. I'm really excited to have you here because as I mentioned in the introduction, this is kind of quite a common trait that I experience in in my work with women. And it's something that has actually been a stumbling block in my journey as a working mum to me truly thriving. So it's great to have you on this show and to, um, to be exploring your wisdom with the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's quite an honour. So in my introduction, I gave a brief overview of who you are and what you do, but could you give us a little bit more insight into into that and um, what you do and how you came to do the work you do? Sure, sure. So uh, for a lot of people, they don't actually know what a clinical psychologist is. So that just means that someone who's helping people work with with mental health problems in a lot of ways. So there can be common mental health problems like anxiety, depression, stress, it can be more severe and enduring problems like psychosis or personality disorders. But me specifically, I work with uh, quite commonly experienced things. So I've worked both in the NHS and now I work solely in private practice. And the kind of people who come to see me, obviously it's a lot of them are working mums, but it tends to be people who are sort of feeling very stressed and busy and um, coming from a, a link with ambition. So really striving to do well, striving to reach perfection and that leading to them burning out or feeling exhausted or like life isn't worthwhile or meaningful. So I help those people kind of move from having that sense of pressure of perfection into letting go of that and finding their purpose so that they can move forward in life in a more meaningful, fulfilling way. Um, So that's sort of not really linked just to mental health problems. Some of them obviously have anxiety disorders, some of them come with some depressed mood, some of them have stress issues, but some of them are just a bit lost. Like most of us will be at times, we're not quite sure of what direction we're going in. So that's sort of the kind of people who come, so both men and and women, uh, but it's predominantly uh, female, I would say. And so how long have have you done this work? It's about half my life, uh, I figured out the other day. Um, wow. So I went into psychology when I was about 18 and trained in Sweden as a clinical psychologist. And now I'm 35, so it's getting up to close to half my life, which is sort of a bit baffling, isn't it, really? Um, so I've been doing it for, for a long time and working mainly clinically, but I, I also work more in organisations now as well, doing more corporate work. 
brilliant. So you mentioned there your country of origin is Sweden, but you're based in London. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. So I moved to the UK in 2010, where I did some further chop up training just to get my qualifications acknowledged here. And that's where I ran my private practice from. Uh, Although I do work a fair bit online as well. So I do um, online sessions and corporate things um, a couple of days a week. And then I go into my private practice uh, in in central London and two days a week as well. Mm. And then one day a week, I am at home with my toddler. Ah, because I was going to just mention that because you're you're speaking from experience here as being a working mum yourself, yes. aren't you? And I'm sure we'll touch yes. on that from both of our perspectives. It's as a we tightrope. Yeah. yeah. So today we're talking about this concept of perfectionism. And I think it's a, it's a term that's often used. Um, and I often refer to myself as a recovering perfectionist. But Sometimes we use it in a very broad way. And I was wondering to to help with our discussion today, whether you could kind of provide a definition of how you define it and how you use it in your work. Hmm. Well, rather than kind of going for an academic definition that might be difficult to understand, one of the key concepts is to understand that it's it's a set of behaviours that we we get caught up in. So a set of things we do or don't do are trying to achieve perfection. So we're striving. So the key thing is that sense of striving, constantly moving towards a moving target, uh, racing a bar um, that we kind of get to the point of going over it and then feel actually that wasn't good enough, so we'll race it some more. So there's a range of behaviours there that lead to an impaired functioning is the sort of clinical term. What that means is it's actually impacting you in a a series of ways. Mm -hmm. For some people, it takes a real toll on their relationships with their partners. For some people, it really impacts on how they thrive at work. They might feel burnt out. They might struggle to perform. Uh, Presenteeism is a common thing that that shows up. That people go to work and sort of shuffle paper around, uh, procrastinate massively. So rather than having sort of this is the one definition, because research obviously has to define things by operationalizing it so we can test it. But the people I tend to see, they just want to know what it means in real life. And what it means in real life is it's costing you more than it's worth. It's costing you more than it's giving you. It's one good way to think of it. What I was going to say is I love that you've defined it as a set of behaviors, because I think sometimes... Um, I know that in the past I've used it as almost like an identity statement. I'm a perfectionist. And not only does that yeah. keep me stuck in that identity, but I love the fact that you've broken it down into behaviours and that you've you've made it kind of, you brought it alive in a more realistic term for people. So thank you. Mm. Well, that's the thing about pigeonholing ourselves. That when we say I am, it's become a part of us. It's become a label or an identity, and that can be really hard to shift. So, uh, even saying sort of my recovering perfectionist can really help us to say I'm going to be this for the rest of my life. And and you were asking me sort of about the title of today. You know, is it sort of how to overcome perfectionism, or is it more about how to live with with having high standards for yourself? And I think that's more about the the, the second one for me, which is. How do I live with having such high standards for myself? How do I live with, you know, this this sort of inner voice of criticism that shows up for me when I try to do scary things, the kind of self-doubt or you know, even imposter syndrome, which I know that you've got a recent episode on. How do I deal with this when I'm trying to do something that I think is worthwhile and meaningful? What do I do when when I'm trying to achieve something and my inner voice says, that's just not good enough? So rather than say I have to overcome it and get rid of it and move away from it, we just need to really let go of the struggle against it and just recognize that certain things, certain aspects of our personality might make us vulnerable for developing perfectionistic behaviors. So sort of like ingredients in a cake, they all need to kind of come together in a sort of chemical reaction in order for the cake to rise. And that's just not your fault. Those ingredients were put in that bowl, not by you. But for you, you know, it's by someone else. So genetic makeup, shaping of your your experiences in your life, how it's been modeled to you, all of that's different ingredients that's come together. And you didn't choose to be a perfectionist. You didn't choose to have this these sets of behaviors because you would. And it's wonderful. As you're speaking, I'm just noticing my shoulders drop because it's that actually, yes, rather than going, <laughs> we've got to overcome it and almost a, another goal or another kind of... Um, 
mm-hmm. objective to set ourselves. It's like, yeah, how do you live with that? And um, often um, when I'm working with clients around high standards, it's almost something that people don't want to let go of anyway. Why would you want to let go of something that mm-hmm. in, in, in a lot of cases has seen you well in life and helped you achieve great things and then you're kind of asking somebody to let go of that when they're you know why would they want to if it's serving them well in a, in in a lot of areas and I'm hearing what you're saying here is just yeah. when it's not serving you well what can you do in those instances yeah so we often think about the definition being uh, or the, the difference being sort of helpful or unhelpful perfectionism mm. or when it's functional or dysfunctional. So functional to me, you know, working with uh, different types of therapies, uh, say for instance, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a lot about functionality, it's just doing what works. Is it workable for you to stay late, you know, at work, say four days a week? Is that workable? Or is that causing you to feel burnt out or spent, uh, missing opportunities to do things with friends and family? That's maybe not so workable. So when it's workable, it has good consequences. It has the best outcomes for you. When it's less workable, the consequences means that it's actually the behavior is costing you more than it's worth. So one way to kind of look at it that we would do in therapy is to kind of look at ABC, kind of what's activating uh, this behavior. What is then kind of triggering you to behave in this way and what is then the actual behavior that's to be and what's to see the consequence uh, for you know good and bad consequences but also short and long term so for a lot of people who who i see in sort of the corporate setting they would feel well why would i lower my standards that's ridiculous i need to perform i need to have this result and what happens when we start to work more on striving for excellence rather than striving for perfection is that the paradoxically speaking the result tends to be better yes. performance actually improves yeah. but it's a then sense of the short term and long term brilliant i think that those are really great kind of examples and models to to kind of share so we've talked about a set of behaviors around perfectionism but what are some of the common symptoms that you might see with perfectionism mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I guess we can sort of think about dividing them into emotional, uh, cognitive and behavioral. So cognitive is a fancy word mm. for thoughts, basically. So the kind of feelings we might have is that we might feel guilty. Uh, we might feel ashamed. We might feel low. Um, we might feel anxious or worried. So this kind of emotional impacts we might have. We might go as far as even feeling disgusted with ourselves. So when you feel that you've missed your standard, that you've fallen below the bar that you've set up for yourself, you might feel so self-critical that you feel Mm. experienced disgust with yourself. And that's very, very strong. We can see that especially uh, in people who have sort of perfectionistic ideals around their body image, that you can feel utterly disgusted with your own body if it doesn't look perfect. And imagine, you know, people who have had kids or mums coming back into the working world they physically look different. You know, they might have taken a period of time off or leave and then they return back to work. That might be followed by thought patterns, you know, thinking that you're not good enough, thinking that other people can do this and you can't, thinking it's um, you're going to fail, thinking you're going to make a mistake and other people are going to judge you. So these are common thoughts that might sort of whirl around people's heads that might then translate into behavior. And a lot of behavior is either striving so we're pushing ourselves really really hard to do things might be working overtime might Mm -hmm. be checking there's a lot of checking for mistakes Um, people might be sort of scanning through their emails before they send them Um, they might be asking for reassurance from other people that's going to be good enough but it's also about avoiding and i like the word hiding there that we we, we sort of sit in hiding where we feel it's not going to be good enough other people are going to judge us then we hide we avoid stepping out of our comfort zone we don't take risks because risks could result in failure and mistakes uh and we then stay very comfortably or you know uncomfortably i should say in a place where we don't feel happy so we might not go for that promotion we might not ask someone out because I wouldn't be good enough. So there's a really strong link between perfectionism and low self-esteem as well. And there's a link between perfectionism mm. and sort of obsessive compulsive behavior. So that's where it can kind of show up in different mental health problems, even though perfectionism in itself is not a diagnosable condition as such, it can kind of 
link into other things like generalized anxiety and so on where we kind of constantly worry that it's not going to be good enough so those are kind of just just a a snapshot yeah. really because i know we don't have all day to talk about what i'm passionate about or how i can help people but these kind of thought patterns these feelings these emotions and these behavioral patterns all kind of make up the broader picture of perfectionism so if you occasionally think oh this shit this isn't good enough and feel a bit ashamed of yourself that's not you being a perfectionist that's you being human these things, uh, this, these experiences that we all have of feeling shame when we worry that we're going to sit negatively in the minds of others, that's not perfectionism. And something that can happen is people who see me that they get really bogged down about trying to meet uh, a criteria or having the definite answer with whether they are a perfectionist. And if we just steer away from that and just think for a moment of, but is this workable for you? doesn't matter what other people look like doesn't matter if there's a criteria for this is it workable for you what you're currently doing if the answer is no then my job is to help them to shift completely um and i know that when we've spoken prior to kind of this interview we've both talked about our own experiences of being working mums and how perfectionist perfectionism has showed up in our own lives and i know Mm. it was something that even before becoming a mum, I struggled with um, perfectionist tendencies. And But actually, when I added in motherhood, it was kind of like this dangerous cocktail because where I would strive and um, keep pushing mm-hmm. myself prior to becoming a mum, but I would have more recovery time. So it almost, I could, I could function really well with it because I would have a weekend be able to, when I wasn't in a work mode, kind of relax a bit more. When I added in motherhood to my kind of working environment, I really kind of felt the impact of it. And that was probably where I was like, mm-hmm, I've got to start to learn how to um, hold my high, high standards in a more kind of manageable way with my life. And I, I don't know if you've, if you've had similar experiences. Yeah, absolutely, Nikki. I think what what you're describing there is so common for working mums where they kind of feel that they've got away with that behaviour almost. It's sort of, it just about worked because you could pull an all-nighter occasionally, you could, you know, work a bit on the weekend or you could get away with having a poor night's sleep because you were fretting about the next day's work. But when you suddenly add in the kids in that equation, it's even harder because you come into that sense of the sort of, the lose-lose situation of hoping that you could parent as if you didn't have a job to go to and work as if you didn't have a child to pick up from nursery. It's, it's unwinning, you know, we can't actually make that work. And the more we can let go of the pressure of trying to get that perfectly, the more we can accept that actually I choose what, what kind of things I'm having in the air at the moment, what I'm going to juggle. And we even get fed that sort of image, that metaphor of juggling all these balls or spinning spinning all these plates. And I've talked about this before um, when I kind of get asked about perfectionism. If we could just steer away from having the image of busyness, of constantly spinning plates, we will then kind of think about letting go of a bit of of that threat system activation anyway. Because if I constantly spin plates, if I look at myself as some sort of weird, you know, clown Mm -hmm. spinning plates in the circus... I would just worry about dropping them. I would worry about something would just completely come crashing down. Whereas if I think about choosing wisely, if I would choose what balls I pick up in the beginning, you know, what you're doing there in your journey is realizing some of these things will have to give. Some of these standards will have to be softened. Otherwise, it will be me spinning plates and dropping shit all over the place. Uh, sorry, I do curse. I quite like profanity. Um <laughs> So that's, it sort of adds emphasis, doesn't it? And it also comes from being a foreigner. Sometimes I don't respect the, the, the level of impact you can have with the F word. But jokes aside, I think when you move away from that image of spinning plates and just thinking that motherhood is really hard, period. Working, having a busy working life is really hard, period. If you combine the two, that's just ultra hard. And just starting with that sense of, wash, this is really difficult trying to navigate my working life with my family values. And I'm so not alone in this. This is a really difficult thing that's hard to balance. And starting yeah. there might mean that we then think, what do I want to let go of? Can it be anything that we'll have to just tolerate doing imperfectly? Um, is it about, is it in the workplace? Is it in the home life? Or is it a bit of both to get that sort of, you know, 
much sought after balance, which I'm not even sure exists. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's more about integration in my mind. But yeah. from your experience then, how does perfectionism tend to hold working mums back then? And do you think it changes when women become mothers? I think it, I'm very passionate about how, in one particular aspect of how it holds working mums back in, in their in their mum life um, by thinking about connection. So what actually feeds connection is vulnerability and authenticity what makes us deeply connect and link to other people and, and feel, oh, they are like us and I am like them, is that we've shared things about ourselves um, and sort of shared a bit of our story. And that yeah. comes from being vulnerable and daring to be per- imperfect, essentially. So we look at a kind of concrete example of what that might look like is say that you are, you know, you're, you're agreeing to meet with a mum friend. What do you do before she's coming over with her kid or her kids? Are you frantically running around the house trying to have every cushion in place and everything needs to look neat and tidy and perfect so she won't see how much of a failure you are at keeping your shit together? Then actually what she sees from her point of view, she just gets to see a glossy facade of you. She doesn't get to see this is how you are struggling too. You are also struggling with this image of trying to get this this balance with capital B and, and knowing it's really hard and it doesn't work most of the time you then miss out an opportunity to connect with her where she might feel, ah, oh, you are like me and I am like you and we can be in this together. And that's the sense of building villages and building tribes from feeling we are like each other, we are kin. That's the thing about kindness comes from, from the word kin. So we, we are sort of linked together. Yeah. So one thing to try is to lower their bar by 2%. You know, if someone's coming over for coffee this week, what would you normally do? And can you lower that by 2% or 5%? That might mean not dusting before they come over or not hoovering or not making the coffee beforehand, but just saying, oh, right, actually, sorry, I haven't got myself so organized just yet. The kids were a menace this morning. Shall I put the, the kettle on? And just doing something a little bit imperfect. You might smuggle it in at first if you feel that you are very sort of you know, hard on yourself or holding yourself to a particular standard, then smuggle in small little changes where you chip away rather than thinking like overhauling it like tomorrow, I'm not going to try to whatsoever, she can come or whatever. If you want to do that, that's yeah. fine. But for most people, that's too much exposure to your fear that would feel like flooding yourself. Um, and you'd feel so uncomfortable you couldn't focus on that conversation. But if you smuggled it in slowly, bit by bit, trying to let go a little bit of your high standard, you might find that people start to turn towards you, resonate with you and invite you over more often. So one of the biggest things I hear from working mums is they fear that everyone else is perfect and they are failing. And because everyone else tries to be perfect, we miss the opportunity to see that we're all the same and we're all struggling, or most of us. Does that make sense as well? Absolutely. And I think, you know, Absolutely. And we've, I've talked about this so many times on this podcast show around, you know, the impact that social media has had on that in terms of increasing yeah. the perception that everybody else is doing it perfectly. And it's quite interesting, the time of recording this episode, this weekend, we've just had my daughter's christening. And um, we had made, when we were deciding what we should do, um, we had the option of having a christening and then um, going to a venue to hold kind of a, a reception afterwards. And me and my husband had talked about, well, let's do something at home. We've got, you know, we've got, you know, we very rarely entertain these days. And one of the reasons for that is not only kind of living quite busy lives, but actually I think yeah. my perfectionism in the past had got in the way of that because I would spend so much energy trying to make everything look perfect beforehand. I used to find it completely yeah, exhausting and just hard. go, I haven't got the energy to entertain, but it wasn't, I hadn't got the energy. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, I hadn't got the energy to entertain. It was, yeah. I hadn't got the energy to entertain in the way that I was going about it. So we made the decision that actually we were going to have a reception back at the house and I'd actually promised myself that if I was doing it, I was going to do it with ease, which was the term mm. that I was using, but actually it was about not doing it perfectly. And it was really interesting going through the weeks leading up to the christening because I was like, yeah, this is really, really easy. And then the last week I could feel my perfectionist tendencies trying to trigger. So I'd 
Yes. And I was, it was really interesting kind of being a fly on the wall observing it because all of a sudden I was like, oh, but I haven't got balloons and I haven't got this and I haven't got that. And I promised myself I was doing it without bells and whistles. You know, if I was going to do it, this is going to be ease. But towards the end, noticing my old patterns triggering and it was really fascinating. Um, but it, and yeah, well, I think it's well done there for, for being able to do that because a lot of people don't have the self awareness where they can see themselves from the outside, having that sort of almost like balcony perspective, looking at down on ourselves. And it's really nice to kind of decide that consciously beforehand, making a wise choice of I'm going to have this party at home and it's going to be with ease. I really like that sort of concept Absolutely. of with ease because then you can keep reminding yourself when that pull comes because that urge is going to come, the impulse is going to come, those are your old habits. And what do I then do? Okay, well, if it was with ease, then no balloons. Okay, if it was with ease, then no entertainer. And it's just cutting off those things that would be the old high standard because it's so hard yeah. to do that when we have this perception around us of, everyone is kind of triggering everyone and uh, thinking that that's how you have to do it. I mean, the amount of three-year-old yeah. birthday parties I'm now invited to, yeah. where they're hired a hall and having an entertainer, and I'm like, but oh, there's three. I won't even remember. It's, it's, it's really hard because society then gives us that pull towards perfection. And if you're at all vulnerable, if you have the sort of, like I said, the ingredients of, of the cake, for that to happen, then entering into motherhood with all the throes of that is really easy for that cake to then just rise in the oven and you want to want to host birthday parties that are, you know, fantastically delivered. So what, have you had the christening yet? Yes, we had it yesterday. So and it, and How did it, it go? Was, it was a really lovely afternoon and I was actually um, – concerned that I wouldn't be able to be in the moment and enjoy it as much because again from past experience of my kind of high standards would mean that I'm I it it stops me connecting in the moment so it was really lovely as listening to you talking about this connection and actually our perfectionism can get in the way of us building our tribe and our village to be with the people that kind of we love family friends and to be able to enjoy that moment so afterwards my reflection was oh gosh, I enjoyed that far more than I thought I was going to be able to. So mm-hmm. that was really nice. And so I suppose a, um, a validation of actually, I did it with more ease. So yes, a bit of a, a bit of a. Yeah, good. That's probably more in line with your values as well, than kind of how you want to show up in those settings. Because the thing is that research shows us that people who are perfectionists, if we're using that label, are actually less likable than those who are a bit more rough around the edges so it's we're more likable so we're more likely to connect with others we're having a better time we're enjoying ourselves more because we're not frantically running around trying to meet the target and they are enjoying themselves more because even if we don't believe it when we caught up in our own self-doubt our friends have come to our house because they've chosen to be our friends they, they want to be there because they want to choose to celebrate that day of the christening with you so they would rather talk to you uh, in a way that's imperfect than have you running around and making sure that everyone's drinks are topped up absolutely and it's that thing isn't it what we what we admire and connect with most in other people is that vulnerability isn't it but it's often what we judge so harshly in ourselves so I think it's great that we're talking about this topic and kind of bringing it to light because I think there's so many people that perhaps suffer with it silently Mm -hmm. um, and assume that they're the only one so what's your advice to anyone listening that's kind of experiencing this or recognizing that actually I have some of those behaviors but often or sometimes they might kind of fall over into the unhelpful zone what what would your advice be I guess the the first thing would be uh, I don't have sort of a your ABCs for perfectionism at the top of my head because I think that's clickbait when we do that like this is your 10 weeks to overcoming blah 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 it's I think it's more understanding that this is a part of you you know, this is this not, it isn't you, it's a part of you. So having sort of your, your inner, your inner critical voice isn't what is the entire, entire sort of, how should I put it, director of your show. So we wanted to still be part of the family, but no longer running the show. Uh, it can still be there. So we learned to kind of develop a different way of speaking with it. So the first thing I want to say is to just kind of realistic standards or realistic, realistic expectations of how you're going to work with this. If you listen to this podcast or other things and you realize I actually am too hard on myself, I'm too scared of failure, I don't, I hold myself back or I overcheck my work and it's taking too much time, then 
don't think that this is going to be go away in a heartbeat. I often get people who come to me and then feel the pressure to be the perfect client and feel the pressure to go through this, this the treatment books perfectly. And uh, the, the amount of times I've had people say, I started reading the books, but then I couldn't do the exercises perfectly, so I stopped. Um, so don't you know, understand that this, this way that it manifests itself in your life is going to show up in the way you try to address it too. You're going to want to do it perfectly. And you're going to want to put pressure on yourself. And you're going to want to beat yourself up when, when it's not going so well. So it's just a snapshot of your life, basically. So if you do seek out therapy for this, just notice what you're doing. Notice how you're Googling to find the perfect therapist. Or notice how you're, um, how you're preparing for the appointment. You know, Do you come in with four, eight, four pages of, of notes? And just take that a little bit lightly. This is just, oh, this is just how you show up at the moment. The set of behaviors can be shifted, but you can't expect to shift it in the best, perf- perfect way possible. Um, I have people who get very competitive about this and think that they're going to they're gonna sort of dazzle me and make me the perfect patient and the best enjoyable treatment I've ever done. And I, I welcome everyone. You know, perfectionism is something that's very diverse. People can come from all walks of life and it can manifest itself in one domain but not others. So keeping in mind as a piece of advice is if you find if you look around in your house thinking, well, my house is a tip, I'm clearly not a perfectionist, you can be really, really um, high, high just kind of striving in yes, one area yeah. of your life but not in another. So you might be struggling with your body image and put, put real pressure on yourself to lose yeah. weight but your house might be a tip or you might, you know, need to really meet kind of, I don't know, you might dance on the deadline before you deliver things at work, but you might be okay to be completely yourself and authentic in your relationship. So it doesn't have to be all global in that sense. So a piece of advice would be if you're looking to work on this, take your time, um, allow this to be sort of an ongoing uh, work in progress so the hashtag of yeah. progress, not perfection, is quite a good one to keep in mind, um, which I use on, on Instagram. Uh, and then just go easy on yourself. You know, arm yourself with some some yeah. support system. Do you know anyone else who's also struggling with this? And can you buddy up on being a little bit less perfect in a sort of lighthearted way? And if you feel that this has got in the way of your life to the point where you're really struggling and you need professional help, then go to your nearest NHS um, NHS service, so you can seek help through your GP or you can self-refer to primary psychology. Or if you feel you'd rather speak to someone private, then do your research to know that they're trained in working with perfectionism because, like I said, it's not a common mental health problem in itself. It's more of a, of a set of behaviours to move across diagnoses. Brilliant. I think that's a great summary, so thank you. One of the questions that's sitting in my mind um, being a mum of both a boy and a girl, is do you believe Mm -hmm. that there is more of a tendency for men versus women with perfectionism or do you see it show up just as much with men as women? Mm, Well, wow, that's a a broad question. That could probably take us an entire podcast just to think about gender issues. Um, I think that it's partly how we socialise. Um, I mean, if I had free yeah. reins to write all the books I want to write, which I can't because you don't make any money off writing books, basically, I want to write a book that's just called Good Girl because we are socialized to be good mm-hmm. girls uh, and do what's expected of us, to apply uh, in a social group, um, to, to, not, to not voice our needs. Uh, women tend to self-silence yeah. more so than men, uh, but men tend to have different displays of this, of how they're, you know, the sort of, the socialized role of the alpha male and testosterone sort of dictates that they should be yeah. strong, not be vulnerable, not be weak. So I think it just takes very different displays. And that's definitely what I hear when I look at unpicking, unpicking people's sort of inner critic. The stuff that they say is very gender socialized based on the norms we have to live up to in society, uh, more so than I would say that it's a sort of biological difference in men and women uh, I think is far more to do with our society and how we're expecting to show up uh, and for women when they take on the role of motherhood I definitely think that that adds an angle to perfectionism because they're expected to do it all in a way that unfortunately because of gender gap again men aren't um, so women get questions about whether they have kids in, in times when men do not um, I'm currently writing a book and 
at some point or another, we might want to have a second child. So I've had questions about, oh, is that a really good idea? Should you write this book if you're going to extend your family and so on? And what man would be asked that question? Are you going to write this book in case you're going to extend your family? And what would that look like? So I think there's something there around how perfectionism does come with cultural biases and expectations that we get from the society we live in. Women do carry a kind of bigger mental load overall than men do. And hopefully we're shifting that with kind of more increased um, gender equality. But yeah, it's it's a massive question that I could talk about. Ray, just being Swedish, um, it's, I'm very passionate about that and how we can work with with these sort of gender norms. Well, thank you for letting me throw that trail forward okay. because that wasn't meant to be part of our discussion. But it's something that I think, um, more widely speaking, I think I've noticed my own journey of um, in motherhood is actually shining a light on some of the areas that I want to work mm-hmm. on, such as my perfectionist tendencies, knowing that actually I need to work on those for it not to pass on to my children. Mm-hmm. And how do I show up in my imperfect vulnerability and, and show them that that's that's okay for them to do and not model mm. kind of perhaps some of my unhelpful behaviors so and I I think after because my firstborn was a boy and I've noticed kind of different stuff showing up after having my girl mm. of actually um noticing some of that cultural bias and and um socialization mm. and, and just being a bit more aware of it so thank you for letting me put that question that's in. okay so we've covered some really amazing stuff you've you've shared with it in a really workable way so thank you if there was just one thing that you're hoping that somebody listening to this podcast takes away from listening to you what would that be uh, it's always hard to do that because then you feel there's the pressure to make that advice the perfect advice i'm kind of notice, noticing that pull um and i did notice that when i was reading through your questions before and thinking actually I'm not going to prepare an answer to these because then I know that the raw version of me will show up and I'll get whatever sort of comes up in the moment, but also based on the expertise I have, of course. But if I'd written down the questions to kind of nail them, to get them perfect, you wouldn't have had the same kind of conversation with me and I would have been really focused on the answer. So I haven't prepared the one thing, but I do think that that's... Thank you for role modelling and sharing that. That's right. That's really important. I do try to practice what I preach, um, but I do think that that's... That's the key thing is to take the pressure off because that, mm. that can relate to anything. That can be in your working role. That can be if you're an entrepreneur like myself. That can be if you're um, if you're a mum of four. I mean, God, I don't get how, you, how people do that, I'm only having one myself. But take the pressure off because nobody holds you to the same regard that you do. Very yes. rarely do people criticise other people as much as they criticize themselves of course that does happen but then we have other issues um most people are harder on on themselves than they are on other people so take the pressure off because nobody's judging you like you are judging yourself Mm. i think that's really powerful absolutely so where can people find out more about you michaela and what you do so do you have kind of website social media and whatever yeah. you share here i'll just say i'll put into the into the um show notes for this so yeah, yeah. far so, away what so you can find me on the thomasconnection.co.uk so obviously because my name is my surname is thomas and i care about connection that's sort of the brand name i have and you can find me under the thomas connection on, on uh, instagram as well thomas connect on uh, Twitter and you can find me as under Michaela Thomas on LinkedIn and also the Thomas Connection on Facebook so I try to be a bit consistent in that way um, so that's where you can connect with me you can you can drop me a message on either of those platforms or you can book a free call with me on the Thomas Connection at UK if you just want to have a chat you know 15-20 minutes for free just to have a chat if to see if this would be something that would work for you and it doesn't mean that you have to have therapy I do a lot of sort of lighter touch stuff as well you know I run workshops and events where I just try to educate uh, and kind of have work with sort of public health prevention rather than just intervention because so many people um, leave it too late so if you kind of think actually I could do with some tweaks I can learn a few things then I run webinars and things like that as well where you might want to just dip your toe in rather than diving deep and that's okay too brilliant and you've kindly put together um a bit of a um document for people to to look at 
in relation to this podcast, haven't you? And I will be yes, putting yes. that, that will be under wisdomforworkingmums.co.uk forward slash yeah. 23, because this is episode 23. Um, yeah. And that will be kind of a summary of what we've talked about today. So people listening yeah. are thinking, actually, I didn't capture all that. You might be listening while you're driving or mm-hmm. walking. Um on that um people can download that worksheet following this conversation so um again i'll yeah. put that um into the show notes as well so okay um, thank so that you will be sort of that, that's okay thank you so much for having me it's been a great conversation and hearing your vulnerable examples also gives me more insight into yeah this is how it shows up for people and this is why i do what i do because I, I really truly believe that when you work with people who you really resonate with you you bring out the best version of yourself so i'll send that through to you which again for full disclosure i haven't written yet so i think that's important about that thing yeah. of, of modeling imperfection so that's why my instagram feed is imperfect i've kind of noticed that pull to make it fully branded and really pretty and i just had to resist it because it doesn't go with the ethos and the values of how i try to show up so yeah i'm looking forward to hearing from anyone and one of the really exciting things i'm doing hopefully for next year is that if you do want to dive deep and not just dip your toes in, I am going to run a retreat in Thailand for people who are very sort of busy, ambitious people who are struggling to let go of that pressure of perfection and just want to move towards a more meaningful life. Then I'm going to be doing a retreat in Thailand in February next year. So do drop me a line if you're interested. Oh, I look forward to seeing the the details on that. Thank you for sharing this because I think this, this aspect of perfectionism really gets in the way of working mums thriving and it's mm-hmm. ultimately what we're all trying to do is do our best um to thrive and be happy but do the work we love i think um the insights you've shared today will be really valuable for people to do that so thank you thank you if you've enjoyed this episode of wisdom for working mums please share it on social media and with your friends and family i'd love to connect with you too so if you head over to wisdom for working mums .co.uk, you'll find a link on how to do this. And if you love the show and really want to support it, please go to iTunes, write a review and subscribe. We'll be helping another working mum find this resource too. Thanks so much for listening.